When we think about this, the Hebrew writer, no doubt, had no problem at looking and listening and living for Christ. Those are three important words. Look, listen, and live. When I think as a Christian, I should not have any problem in doing so. If I'm living the Christian life, I should have no problem looking to Jesus. He's the one that I should be emulating. He's the one I should be giving my attention to, first and foremost. I need to be listening to Him, not audibly. <clears throat> Jesus is not going to speak into my ears. But He does speak to me through the Word. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, go into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature, He told them at the end of that, toward the end of it, having them to observe all things whatsoever, I have taught you or told you. When I read Matthew through Revelation, as it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, you can truly say that, yes, indeed, these also, no doubt, were the things that Jesus taught His disciples. Many things, John said, that were written in this book that were not put down, or that Jesus said that were not put down in this book. When I think about him not having any problem, the Hebrew writer, I want to be like him. Those to whom he wrote were having some problems in doing so. It's pretty obvious. And it's obvious today, 2015, there are some today who have a real problem looking and listening and living for Christ and I'm not talking about in the world. I'm talking about even in the church. That's what I'm talking about. Many had a problem with giving up the law of Moses. They did. Today we don't have that problem in the church. We have other problems. Materialism. Pride. Self-righteousness. Whatever you want to call it. And so therefore it causes us to not look at Jesus the way we need to, nor to listen to the words He has to say and most of all to live for Him. But they were not able to focus. You see their vision was blurred when it came to placing Christ properly in their lives. In a short while we're going to be singing a song entitled, Come to Jesus. That's more than a song. It's a great invitation. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest, Jesus says. Take my yoke upon me, that is his words, his teachings, his law, and learn of me from low in heart. He, he was such a meek one. And so they had a problem, and so they weren't able to really properly place Christ into their lives. Brethren, we could be just like that. And we will be just like that unless we do look, listen, and live for Christ. The Hebrew writer would help them to see Jesus as they should. I could not help you see Jesus more than Scripture can. If we really want to see Jesus as He is, open your Bibles. Study about Him. Read about Him. Look at Him. Listen to Him and live for Him. And so we too are to be looking and listening and living for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But He requires a tremendous value in our lives. You see, where our heart is, Jesus said, that's where our treasure will be. It's where our heart is. Right now, as you stop and think about it, what does the church mean to you? By that, I mean, what does Christ mean to you? Because you see, the church belongs to Him. We are the bride of Christ, the church of Christ. 
And so I say that they were told to focus and look at Christ as we read about there in Hebrews 12 too. We are to do no less. But it takes a tremendous amount of focusing to see right. It's amazing to me as I look at my own health, I can tell it's deteriorating, particularly my eyes. My eyes are not near as strong as they were a year ago. It takes more for me to focus now than it ever did in my lifetime. I know what it means to focus. I think we all know what it means to focus. And so we are to focus on Jesus. And I want you to note this in Hebrews, the next verse, Hebrews 12, 3. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. That's so important. Lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Whew. That's something to consider. You know, the devil works like this. He gets into our mind. If he can get into our minds and start controlling our minds, he has us. And I'm afraid that we don't realize how much control he does have on us at times. Whether it be our feelings, or our emotion, our character, our attitude, our spirit. You know, the people in Laodicea, they, those Christians, they thought they were quite all right. They didn't really need Jesus. He said, oh, you do. He said, as a matter of fact, you're, you're naked and you're wretched. You're miserable. But he did tell them there was hope. But we need to be careful lest we become wearied. Paul tells us, do not become weary in well-doing. W-E-A-R-Y. In well-doing. And so therefore we have to look at Jesus. Look at our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Because the writer said, for consider Him. Here in a short while we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We're going to partake of the bread, which to us is the body of Christ. We're going to partake of the cup, which to us represents the blood and is the blood of Jesus. He shed that for us. The unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, and yet the Bible tells me to examine myself before I partake of it. If I consider Jesus, if I consider Him, I don't want to eat and drink damnation to my soul. But if the devil has played with my mind and my emotions enough to where I don't even really consider too much about what the Lord's Supper is all about, then it's just something, it's another thing I go through just before the services are over with. You see, we must consider Him. No one can seriously look at verses 2 and 3 without, now I've said seriously, without an awareness of someone important. And I say that reverently. Jesus Christ. You and I cannot fathom what He went through. We have Scripture telling us that He was beat to a point where He wasn't recognized. We see in Scripture where he drew his last breath. And yet he would say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was the very one that instituted the Lord's Supper. Take, eat, this is my body. Take, drink, this is my blood. You see, in order to do that, you have to consider him. Consider Jesus and what he went through. When Matthew 6, when Jesus told his disciples to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what he was simply saying is, consider me. Consider. That's very important. These passages instruct us to focus on Jesus Christ. Where are your thoughts right now? What are you focusing on? I don't know. But God does. And so it's important we see these scriptures and not let them slip from us. We all know that Jesus was more than willing. He paid a tremendous price for us to be who we are today. For us to be where we are in life. Who we are and what we are means so much. And that's so important. For just a moment, please consider... 
please consider those to whom you know, those to whom you love, that are no longer interested in the church, that are no longer focused on the Lord as they once were. They no longer are faithful. That's painful, isn't it? But you see, their souls are just as precious as mine and yours. Jesus loves them just like he loves me and you. We need to be doing everything that we can to get them to have a proper eyesight. I know someday soon I'm going to have to go to an eye doctor and, and get uh, new glasses. I know it's coming. I don't know when I'll do it. But, and that doctor will help me to be able to focus better and see better. That's his job or her job. You see, when I open the Bible up and study from it, it helps me to focus on my Lord and my Savior. To be able to say to Him how grateful I am, God Almighty, how grateful I am that You love me so much, that You allowed Your only begotten Son to come to this earth and to live and to die. It amazes me how the church is today sometimes. It doesn't take anything to upset us doesn't take anything to offend us. As I said in Bible class this morning, so often we walk around carrying our feelings on our shoulder like a chip. That's, on, that's just so, it's so sad, unfortunate. But if we were to really focus and look at Jesus Christ, I'll tell you one thing, it'll cause us to think differently. It'll cause us to act differently. It'll cause us to react differently. You see, when you consider those to whom you know that are no longer faithful, it breaks your heart. And they have no more interest in Him. They have lost their eyesight when it comes to Jesus. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. I can sit in a building for the rest of my life and sit on a pew but that doesn't mean I'm focused on Jesus. It's what I do with my life that speaks volumes about where my focus is. But when you think about and look at the one who endured the cross, oh yes, he despised the shame. You better believe he did. Yet he was willing to pay the price that he had to pay. I don't like it when people speak evil of me, do you? Do you like it when they speak evil of you? No, you don't like it. When someone has said something that's really not true about you, it, there's some sting to that. But we must not give up. We must do what Jesus did there on the cross when he said, Father, forgive them. That is, have a forgiving spirit. And so it's important that we focus on Jesus. You know why? Because when we look truly and focus truly on Christ, this is what we will see. We will see Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, can you imagine that? Let that sink in just for a moment. Who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. He knew what He was doing and He knew His purpose. And he was willing to suffer for me and for you and for everyone else. And sometimes we don't even focus on that. Sometimes we just want to air our feelings about what we think or what we feel. Not focusing at all on Jesus, that is. But you see, he was despising. He endured the cross, but he despised the shame. <clears throat> It wasn't easy for him to take those accusations that were thrown at him, falsely accused, and ultimately put to death. But guess what? Jesus stayed focused. He knew if he did the will of his Father, he would not only become and would be the Savior of the world, but he would go back and sit on the throne with his Father the right hand throne of God. That should humble us. Oh, how that should humble us. 
But also, they were told to listen to Christ. Listening is very important. It's a very important part of life. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 25, the Hebrew writer said again, See that you refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not whom, excuse me, for if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaks from heaven. Wow. What a wonderful thought. But also what a horrifying thought at the same time. Again, I'm not going to hear the voice of Jesus until the day of judgment. I will hear his voice then audibly. But if I study it through the New Testament, I will hear the voice of Jesus through his words. As I study those words, I will see a voice of love and care and compassion and concern. I will hear a voice of humility, a voice of forgiveness, a voice of patience and long-suffering. I will hear a voice of love and much care and compassion. Why would we not want to listen to Jesus. In Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5, while he yet spake, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Whoa. God was so pleased with his Son, he would say to the world, Listen to my Son. Why? Because he has the words of eternal life. Yes, indeed he does. Hear him. We must listen to Christ. But why do we listen? Do I think this morning I have everyone's attention? I'd hope so. But I'm not that naive. I'm really not. But I would like to think that we'd listen to Jesus when we'd listen to no one else. Because that's how important it is. As I said in John 6, 68, when Peter said unto Jesus, To whom shall we go? Jesus, I mean, he said, Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter recognized that. And yet Peter was the one who denied Jesus, didn't he, at one time? Cursed Jesus. Said he didn't know him. And then he became one of the greatest Christians there ever was that walked on the face of this earth. Became an apostle of Jesus Christ. Became an elder in the Lord's church. A great teacher and preacher. A great man of God. Why? Because he focused on Jesus and he listened to Jesus. Just like you and I must do. Let me tell you this. <clears throat> Christ must be heard. He must be. Why? Because he has the words of eternal life, as Peter said in John 6. We must hear Jesus. And so, when we are listening to him, we're in his word. Someone asked me some time back, I, was, I forgot where I was at. It seems as though I don't know where I was at. But somehow I walked up and the person said, I have a feeling you're, you're either a preacher or a lawyer. And I don't know why he said that. I said, well, I am a gospel preacher by the grace of God. He said, you know, I, I, I can just tell. He said, but let me ask you a question, sir. When was the last time Jesus spoke to you? Oh, I said about 7 o'clock this morning. What did he say unto you? I said, well, let me just stop you right now. I want you to know how Jesus spoke to me. And it may not be in the way that you think, but I, he spoke to me through his word. He took his hand and he said, I want to shake your hand, sir. He said, you know, my Bible teaches me that, G that God is no respecter of persons. I don't know what the preachers I see coming through here and I like to ask them, when was the last time they spoke to Jesus or God or the Holy Spirit, the oneness, the Godhead? And he said almost all of them will say that he spoke to him personally 
in an audible voice, a small, sweet voice. And he said, I knew then they were not honest. Now, the guy had to leave. I wanted to spend some time with him because the manager, and I understand about working and all, but the manager told him he needs to get back to work. I haven't seen that man since then. I don't know if he was a Christian or if he wasn't, but I know one thing. He knew, and he knows that God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, speaks to us via the Word. He knew that. Oh, it sounds good to these big old preachers that get on TV and say, the Holy Spirit moved me. The Holy Spirit said this. The Holy Spirit did that. My God spoke to me. Jesus spoke this sweet voice into my ear. It sounds good and it is appealing to masses of people. But that's all it is. You see, we need to listen to Jesus because he does have the words of eternal life. Sadly, some in the church no longer listen to him. They listen to themselves. <clears throat> they had rather hear their voices than the voice of Jesus. And again, I don't mean that audibly. I mean through the voice of these words. They're sort of proud of themselves and they become arrogant and self-righteous and pompous. But they're just not going to listen to Jesus they really and truly have no interest in what he has to say to them. No. And that's sad. But you know, if we're not going to look or focus on Jesus, if we're not going to listen to him via his word, guess what? We're surely not going to live for him. But we must live for Christ. That should be our lives. That should be our goal and that should be our motive. That should be our passion and compassion to know what Jesus has done for me. All that he did. I can't even begin to suffer like Jesus did. No. Can you imagine? I don't think we can, but I know one thing we can do. We can look at him. We can listen to him. And we can live for Christ. You would think that this would be exactly what everyone would do. I'm talking about in the church. I'm not talking about anyone outside the church. Those outside the church are lost. I'm talking about those of us that are in the church. You would think that we'd have such a love and compassion for Jesus. That he is the one that we're living for. We should have the spirit of Paul for me to live as what? Christ. And to die is what? Gain. Do we have that? Do we even think about that? Do we even consider that? For me to live is Christ. Wherever I go, whatever I do, I tell people about Jesus and about His church, about His saving blood. The one who died for you is the one who died for me. He didn't die for a country. He didn't die for countries or a nation or nations. He didn't die for certain people or peoples. He died for everyone. What an amazing thought. And so I must live for him. When you think about in the days of this writing, the Hebrew writing I'm talking about, guess what? They were living in dangerous times then. A lot of persecution. Brethren, you and I know we have no clue what it is to be persecuted as a Christian. We're so blessed. Do you realize there's Christians, well, so-called, I mean, they believe in Jesus. They are not Christians based upon Scripture. They're, ba they're basing what they've been taught. But do you realize in parts of the world right now, if you're saying that you're a believer in Jesus, you're a dead person. They'll take you and kill you. They'll rape your wife. They'll rape your daughter. They'll sell your daughter to slavery. They will give your daughter over to a militant group to make her as hateful as they are. Just because they call themselves a Christian. Some of us have no clue what's really going on because we're so focused on self. And yet when I think about this, 
These brethren were living in some very dangerous times. And they were going out of the camp to safety. And so in these days of this writing, the, they would do this for their safety. But then guess what? <clears throat> if they were caught, it would require a sacrifice. Here's what he says in Hebrews 13, 13. Let us therefore go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. You see, we need to go outside these doors. We, you and I, need to go outside of the camp, not because it's unsafe, but we need to go outside the camp bearing his reproach, bearing his shame and suffering. You and I need to do it with joy, knowing that I'm living for Christ. That's an amazing thought to me also. So let us, do as the Hebrew writer said, go forth unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. You know, some people will never let people know they're members of the church out in society. <clears throat> I've seen it. Some are ashamed to tell people they're members of the church of Christ. I cannot imagine that. I can't really let that sink in and get that. I cannot do that. But when you don't live for Christ, when you do not listen to Him, when you do not focus on Him, guess what you will do? You will deny Him. Maybe not verbally, but by your actions. Yeah. You see, in their case, as I said, they were being persecuted. They were ridiculed for being Christians. They were suffering in ways that you and I don't have a clue. And it would even mean death to some. And it mean that they would have to sacrifice all. You know, we sing a song sometimes. All to Jesus I surrender. Isn't that a beautiful song? You better believe it. All to Jesus I surrender. I wonder how much we really are surrendering to Jesus. I wonder sometimes. I wonder how much we're really focusing on Jesus. How much we are really listening to Him. Because the way we focus on Him and the way we listen to Him will determine the way we live for Him. As I said this morning in the Bible class and I said as I began to close this out, I want to pass a little challenge to you. A little further than what I said in class, but I want to pass this challenge to you. This is the first day of the week. The past seven days, how many times did you pick up your Bible and study it? How many times? You answer that. How many times did you go to God in prayer with thanksgiving. Did you pray any for the church here at Nettleton? Did you pray for our elders? Did you pray for me? Did you pray for anyone in this congregation? Did you pray for our deacons? Did you pray for the furtherness of the works of the church here at Nettleton? Did you do that? Have you prayed for an upcoming meeting? Have you prayed for it? Have you prayed for Maxie as he's prepared to come and preach to us? Do you intend to come to the meeting every single night, God willing? You see, it becomes very personal when you live for Christ. Now, you expect me to be here. And guess what? I'm going to be here not because I'm the preacher here. I'm coming because I love God. I love Christ. I love the gospel. I'm coming to hear the word proclaimed. I'm coming as a Christian. I'm coming because I'm your brother, and si uh, brother in Christ and you're my brothers and sisters. I'm coming here to help edify the church. You see, it becomes very personal when you begin to focus on Jesus. When you truly begin to listen to Him. 
And let me say this, you're not listening to them if you're not opening the Word and studying. And I will tell you this, if you're not studying, you're not focusing on Him. I'm not being rude, I'm just being honest. And I guarantee you, if you're not focused on Him, and you're not, again, listening to Him, you're not living for Him. Brethren, believe me, we can sit in the pews and be just as lost as anyone out in the world. Just coming to services do not make us a Christian. We must focus, we must listen, and we must live for Christ. You all know that as well as I do. When I consider the price that was paid for me, I would cry, but someone would say, well, he's becoming charismatic. I don't know about you, but I really mean this. There's times when Marge and I, when we've gone to bed, I sleep in another room now because she sleeps in a chair and she doesn't turn her light out until about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, I guess. I don't know when she turns it off. But there's times when I close that door because I, it has to be dark for me to sleep most of the time. There's times I'll slip out of the bed and I'll just fall on my knees. and I have so much to thank God for. So much. It makes me want to cry with tremendous thanksgiving to know what my Savior did for me. That's why it breaks my heart to see what's happening to His bride, the church. We need to understand who we are. And so as I close, let each and every one of us go from the camp. Let's go from the camp. Go move outside the camp here. Go outside these walls and these doors. Talk to our neighbors, our husbands, our wives, our children, our grandchildren, our sons-in-laws, daughter-in-laws, strangers. Reach as many as we can to the glory of God. Teach them to look at Jesus and to listen to Him and to live for Him. But we have to bear His reproach. Have you ever had doors closed in your face? Of course you have. And whenever you teach someone, you're not going to reach the masses of people anymore. But you know one thing we must do is sow the seed. All of us, every single one of us, sow the seed. We must water it. And guess what? If it falls on good and honest hearts, God will give the increase. That's what Paul let the church in Corinth know. But they have to do their part. And so, yes, you're going to be ridiculed and you're going to be made fun of by some. And yes, and it may require sacrifice. And by the way, I believe it does. Sacrifice the time. I wonder sometimes how much time we do give to God and His study. I wonder in this day and age of entertainment how much time we sacrifice if with our time in giving to teaching others. How much time do we spend in trying to lift up this congregation here at Nettleton? How much time? How much sacrifice? How much are we willing to give? How much sacrifice are we willing to give? Or are we just comfortable in coming and sitting in our pew and going home? I would say this with love. If that's all we do, then we're failing. You're failing God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. You're failing them. But you're also failing yourself. You see, God, Christ, the Holy Spirit will never see hell. Gehenna. They'll never spend eternity one moment, one second in hell. But there is a place prepared for those who will not focus on Jesus, who will not listen to Him, and who will not live for Him. The choice is ours. It is our decision as to what we do or don't do as, as a child of His. He loves us, but He's not going to tolerate wrong in any shape or form. He's a just God. 
You see, it's easy, brethren, to take things for granted. It's easy to get bent out of shape, become cantankerous, obnoxious. It's easy to gossip, and it's easy to this, and it's easy to that. But also you could turn that energy into something else. And that is focusing and listening and living for Jesus. But we have to do that in order to hear him say, well done. I ask one simple question. Are we truly looking at Jesus the way we need to? I'm not asking you this. I ask myself, am I doing that? I would hope and pray that you'd do the same thing to yourself right now. Just do a little bit of soul searching. Am I really looking at Jesus? Am I really listening to Jesus? Am I really living for Jesus? Those are the three most sobering questions that anyone could ask themselves. Either I am on fire for the Lord or I'm not. Either I'm serving Him with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, or I'm not. There is no lukewarm Christian going to make it to heaven. Oh, that's asking too much. You've got to be kidding me. Too much to focus on Jesus? Too much to listen to Him? Too much to live for Him? All that He's done, all that He did, and all that He's doing. It's a tremendous peace for me when I pray that I know Jesus is listening to me as well as God. And He's my interpreter. It gives me tremendous peace to know when I go to God, sometimes I become clueless in what to say. But it's a wonderful peace to know, as Paul said to the church at Rome, the Holy Spirit groans for me. How blessed I am. How blessed. Sometimes we focus so much on the negatives, we never want to see the positive. But many times we just want to make ourselves be seen and be heard. If you want to be seen and be heard, do it the way God wants you to. That's what's important. You see, when it's all said and done, I don't believe there's a person in here that wants to spend eternity lost. I don't believe that. But if the devil has gotten into our minds thinking, oh, you're right, that, that's, go ahead. No, be careful. Because Satan does use mind control. And if we fail to study and hear and obey this, guess what? He's in control. He has us. Oh, well, he doesn't mind us carrying this and putting it next to our chest as long as we don't open it and live it and confess it. He doesn't mind us coming and sitting in pews Mondays, excuse me, Sundays and Wednesdays and gospel meetings and VBSs and any other thing. He doesn't mind as long as we don't live it. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out devils or demons in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful works in thy name? In the name of Jesus they did this. But guess what he's going to say? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. That's haunting to me. You see... That's how real it is. Look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Have you ever counted your blessings? Have you really realized how blessed you are as a Christian? Do you not realize we're brothers and sisters in Christ and we should be lifting each other up, helping each other every day that we can? Some you can't help because they're not going to listen. Some are rebellious in the church. There's nothing you can do about it. Their heart's not right. But the thing I am saying is, we have to be right. And if our heart's right, we're going to do the best we can. We definitely will look at Him, we'll listen to Him, and we will live for Him. This morning, if you're not a Christian, can you imagine right now what Jesus wants from you? He wants you to come to Him. Come to Jesus. 
through obedience to the gospel. Be baptized, immersed, Colossians 2.12. Have your sins washed away, Acts 2.38. Confess him as the eunuch did in Acts 8.37. He'll add you to his church, Acts 2.47. For those of us that are Christians, maybe we need to come back to Jesus. You know, James is right. We we'll confess our faults one to another, pray one for another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. 